Hey everyone, so it's Hearth and welcome back to my channel. On today's video, I'm finally back from Glastonbury and I'm going to be going through all of the things that I purchased from the witchcraft and pagan stores while I was there. <music> Many of you will likely know that Glastonbury is one of my favourite places on earth. It is not only beautiful, but it is full of witchcraft and pagan shops. You can climb the tour, you can go and see the wells, you can have therapies, healings, you can talk to so many amazing people, and you can also get a lot of amazing witchcraft items. Now I don't go to Glastonbury very often, I go maybe once a year, typically over my birthday, and I will vlog it while I'm there. If you do want to see the vlog, I posted it last week, I will leave the link in the description box and I'll also leave it linked up here if you would like to see what I got up to while I was down there. While I am in Glastonbury, I do often spend money in the small businesses and the brick and mortar witchcraft stores. Although I like supporting all kinds of small businesses, brick and mortar stores do have a lot more overheads than online stores do. And so while I'm down there, I really like supporting them because ultimately, if we don't support them, they won't stay open. And then the next time I go down, they'll be gone. And that would be tremendously sad. So I will leave the links and the names of all of the items in the description box, as well as the shops, if you would like to check them out for yourself. Not all of them ship internationally, but a lot of them do. So the links are down there anyway, if you would like to check anything out for yourself. The last thing I will say before we dive into this video is that you don't need all of the books, candles, herbs, and items that I do purchase for witchcraft in order to have a successful magical practice. It's important to remember here that not only do I educate on YouTube, I have a personal practice and I also have a witchcraft business. And because of that, I do get a lot of reference books, I get a lot of herbs, a lot of material that maybe the average practitioner doesn't need. So just bear that in mind, everyone is gonna have different collections, everyone is gonna have a different extent of a collection. You do not need a massive collection to have a very successful magical practice. So with that all being said, let's start with some candles. It's probably quite obvious if you spend any amount of time on my channel that I love using candle magic. It isn't the only form of magical practice that I do, but it's definitely a big percentage. I just love working with candles, I like working with the fire element, I like working with fire elementals, I just love working with candles. They're very effective for my magical practice, and so while I was in Glastonbury, I had to get some candles. Now the main place that I go to get candles from is Starchild. Starchild is a massive witchcraft shop on Glastonbury High Street. It's been around for about 50 years and every time I go down I typically come away with either incense or candles. You'll likely have seen me use many of their loose incenses on my altar setups as I absolutely love the formulas, but I will also go in and get some candles. Recently, I've been changing how I use my candles, and instead of just using one candle for one working, I'm actually using very, very large candles for many workings. So, when I was in Starchild, I did pick up some of these extra large candles. These are actually not the biggest candle that they do in Starchild. I think they do three by 12 inch candles. So they're three inches wide, 12 inches tall. This is the one by 12. They also do a two by 12 and a three by 12. I like getting these ones though, although technically I would have got the two by 12s if they had any in stock, but they were completely out. I did get two of these. I got a plain green and an ivory white. And that's because the majority of the workings that I do on a daily or weekly basis are for either protection, purification, cleansing, or money. And so I like having a black candle, a white candle, and a green candle. Now unfortunately they didn't have any black candles of these, so I got a white one instead and I'm just going to substitute this one out. I do find that white is really good for cleansing and protection anyway, so this is a suitable substitution. These will typically burn for a very, very long time. So what I will do is I will stick a pin in a part of the candle. That's where that working is going to end. So the pin represents the end of the working. I will either stick one in or I will stick one in on either side. Then I will dress the top portion of the candle. I will carve in any symbols, sigils, words. I will dress it with oil, powders, herbs. I will charge it and then I will burn it down until the pins fall out. And then that is the end of that working. I can then blow out the candle, the working is done. You might wanna snuff it out, depends on the kind of working that you're doing. And then I will just go down 
the next bit and then the next bit and then the next bit. But because you're only charging up to where the pin is, you don't then need to cleanse the candle repeatedly, which is super useful. And I just really enjoy using candles in this way. But for this candle, you need fire safety. So I did get a candle holder to be able to put said candle in because never ever ever do candle magic without fire safety. Make sure you have a suitable holder or it is secured in a suitable way and make sure that you do have something to put out the fire if it does get out of hand. So please always stay safe. But on candles that are this tall, I like having a suitable candle holder for them. I did also get Another of these candles, this one is slightly different. This is a moon candle. This is one of their infused candles. So they do the plain candles and then they do these ones which are infused with oils and they are essentially charged for purpose. So this one is associated with lunar energy and I'm gonna be using this to help with spiritual development and astral projection, primarily having control over astral projection. It's getting really annoying now, the lack of control, so I need to develop that, so I've got this one. Now these do come with this little image on the front that gives you a little bit of information about it, and they do smell as well. It's not strong, it's just a faint smell because of the oils that are infused in them, but I'm really excited about this one. I then also got a ginormous candle holder. This is for the 12 by two inch candles. I might actually already have one of these, but it's so full of wax that I like having an extra one. This is so that I can burn the extra large candles safely on the altar because this is a really deep candle holder so they won't just fall over. While I was in Glastonbury, I did also end up getting quite a lot of herbs, oils, and incenses. And I got all of these from Sons of Asgard. Sons of Asgard is a beautiful shop on the high street. They've actually moved into that shop since I last went down and it is so gorgeous. It's in the old bank and it's just so nice. I might have spent many, many hours in there picking things out. I apologize to everyone who was with me or around me at that time because I ended up with the sheet of herbs just going through them all. So I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly, but these are some of the things that I have most recently added to my collection. We have some black willow bark, lemongrass, golden red rosebuds, heather flowers, apple blossom, life everlasting flowers, peony petals, nettle root, peach blossom, pomegranate flowers, and yellow rosebuds. So those are all the herbs that I got. I was standing there for about an hour trying to figure out exactly what I wanted. I do have quite an extensive range of herbs already. So I did just get the more unusual things, the things like yellow rosebuds, golden red rosebuds, peony petals, the things that although I can get hold of, it's often quite difficult to get hold of them from a single plant in the volume that I would like without negatively impacting the plant. So I do prefer maybe not picking every single bud off a plant because I would never do that, it's just rude to the plant. So I do like adding things like this into my collection in quite small volumes, just so that I can have them available if I do need them. I did also get some oils and some incense that are associated with the Oum. I have spoken about the Oum in the past. I have worked with the Oum alphabet for the better part of 10 years now, and I have a few favorite Oum trees that I do work with quite often. And so I got quite a few oils. I got an oak oil and I also got the oak incense sticks by Sons of Asgard. Now oak is actually my birth tree in the Oum Zodiac. So I am gonna use these specifically for this time of year to help with the workings that I'm going to be doing currently. I then also got a willow, an apple and a blackthorn. These are some of the plants that I work with the most, especially the Oum trees. And you'll likely recognize blackthorn in here because that is part of the name of my podcast. I couldn't not get this because I do like working with the interconnectedness of blackthorn. Blackthorn is very much a liminal tree. It is very closely associated with the fair folk, with the spirit planes, with the other world. And so I really like using blackthorn for that. Apple is mainly for abundance, fertility, prosperity, bringing things in fruitfulness, essentially, because apple is abundant in everything that it creates. So I've got that for that. 
I then have Willow for the healing, nurturing, motherly properties. That is how I work with Willow. And then the Oak I use for protection, stability, and longevity. So that's how I use all of these. I'm planning on doing lots and lots with these. They did have other options as well, such as sprays and the like, but I just got the oils because it's easier for me to adapt to what I need. So that's all I actually got in that category of herbs, oils, and incenses. You wouldn't think that that took me maybe three hours to decide upon, but it did. I am not the most concise decision maker, but I did get there eventually. And also I just love talking to all of the shop owners as well. I did get one crystal while I was down there. Now I typically don't purchase crystals that often anymore. I do have a small collection of crystals that I did collect back in the 2010s, but I don't really add to it that often. There was however, one stone that I have really wanted in my collection for many years. And the fact is after three years, I still wanted it in my collection. So I got it. This is it, this little tiny stone. It is a bumblebee jasper. This is a stone that has been screaming out to me for years and I finally got around to getting it. I saw it, I couldn't let it go. I measured up all of the other ones. I was holding them, trying to figure out which one screamed at me the most. This is the one that screamed at me the most. It was not the prettiest, it was not the biggest. It is actually a little bit damaged, but this is the one that I ended up going for. So everyone out there, if you have a stone that is calling out to you, but it isn't the prettiest in the batch, pick it. Because oftentimes the way it feels to you is more important than how perfect it might look. So this is one of the rare new additions to my crystal collection that I am very excited to start working with. Now let's get to the bit that you're probably all waiting for the books. I actually got quite a lot of books. You can actually see them stacked in a pile or two next to me. On day one, I actually didn't get that many books. And then I went back on day two and I got way more <laughs> as I was probably expecting. I kind of wondered if it would happen again this year. It definitely did. Now I am gonna split these books into the bookshops that I got them from. I actually went to two bookshops this time. I went to The Speaking Tree and I went to Courtyard Books. Now for reference, The Speaking Tree is on one side of the road. It primarily focuses on new release books. Courtyard Books is on the other side of the road and it primarily focuses on secondhand, limited edition, first edition, signed copies and other more unusual books. I typically prefer Courtyard Books over The Speaking Tree, but that is because I do have a witchcraft book collection, and so I do like getting some of the more unusual pieces. So let's start with The Speaking Tree, because I'm going to leave you hanging. There is an amazing book at the end of this video. You're just gonna have to get to the end to be able to see it. So these are the books that I got from The Speaking Tree. I got one, two, three, four, five books. I don't typically get that many from The Speaking Tree because I do, as mentioned, typically prefer courtyard books. I prefer the more unusual reads. So the first book that I got is Old World Witchery by Raven Gramassi. Now Raven Gramassi is a really popular author. I really enjoy their book on familiars. And I'd seen this one floating around the internet for a while and I knew that I had to get it and read it. The blurb reads as follows. In Old World Witchcraft, noted author Raven Gramassi invites readers into his garden, where plant spirits dance in the moonlight and shadows pass into every incantation. He goes beyond the romantic notions of what witches are or should do, arguing that many of our current ideas about witchcraft are based on misinformation. Using his vast knowledge of history and herbal lore, he offers the reader simple but powerful tools to make their own witchcraft. For the first time, Gramassi introduces readers to a magical system, the Ash, Birch and Willow, rooted in the initiatory teachings and understandings of Old World Witchcraft. The use of the mortar and pestle as a spellcasting tool, and using plant ash for magical sigil work, plus totally new information about familiar tools such as the witch's wand and broom, are all presented here to aid the modern witch in reconnecting with the organic memory of the earth and developing their own spiritual understanding of botany. And so for me, I was really intrigued by this. I wanted to get it for a long time, 
finally saw it, finally got it. I have heard mixed reviews on this book, so I'm gonna give it a go. As usual, I'm gonna come at all of these books with an open mind to see whether I actually like them or not. So look out in the future for these books to go into my quarterly book breakdowns, and I'll talk a little bit more about them there. The next book is Fire Magic by Josephine Winter. Now this is part of the Elements of Witchcraft book series. I actually already have the Water Element book of this series. There is also Air and Earth, so I will ultimately end up with all of them, but for right now I just have this one. Many of you know, and I've mentioned it earlier, I love working with the Fire Element, I love working with Candle Magic, and I really wanted to try and develop that further. I thought this book could be a good option. The blurb goes as follows. Bring the passionate element of fire into your practice with this captivating entry in Llewellyn's Elements of Witchcraft series. Featuring spells, rituals, recipes, and folklore, Fire Magic shows you how to fully harness the flame and add new meaning and energy into your life. Join author Josephine Winter on an illuminating exploration of fire and its many uses in witchcraft. Discover candle and bonfire magic throughout history, how fire is depicted in mythology, and fire-related celebrations for the Sabbaths. Learn about correspondences, sacred herbs and woods, and how to stay safe while honouring this element. Featuring guest contributors, fire deities, mythical beasts, crystals and more, fire magic inspires you to reignite your passion for magic. Now, I did enjoy the first in this series, The Water Element. I'm not sure if it was technically the first, but it's the first one I read. And so I really wanted to give this one a go. Next, we have The Flame in the Cauldron by Orion Foxwood. Now, this is another one, as expected, that I've seen floating around for a long time. And I was really curious about it. As I said a minute ago, I love cauldrons, I love fire, fire magic. One of my deities is Keridwen. She is associated as the keeper of the cauldron of knowledge. And because of that, I just had to get this book. This one reads as follows. Few words entice and incite like the word witchery. Thousands of self-identified witches, pagans, and magical practitioners embrace the word, but seldom go beyond the practice of the well-accepted and learned forms of traditional witchcraft to explore the path of old witchery. Orion Foxwood invites readers to walk the path of the old-style witchery, a nature-based practice that is as old as the swamps and as wild as the woods. For the first time, Foxwood reveals some of his own deeply personal rituals and spells directly from his own grimoire of witchery. He highlights the differences and similarities between Wicca, traditional witchcraft, and old-style witchery by weaving his own path to witchery throughout the book. He gives readers examples of how to identify the way towards this path. There is a revolution among the pagan and witchcraft communities, a movement away from prescribed ritual and neo-pagan practices, and a reaching back towards what Foxwood says is in the heart of any true witch, a thundering call deep from their very blood to become a healer, a reckoner, a protector of magical arts, and a guardian of the wild woods. So I just had to get this. It's on old style witchcraft, which is exactly what I love to practice. And so had to get it. I just couldn't resist. Then we have a book I've actually never seen before. This is Witchcraft Into the Wilds by Rachel Patterson. Now I have known of the author before. I've just never ever seen this book. It was actually the first one I got, I think, the entire day. This is one of the first ones that I purchased. This one reads as follows. Witchcraft Into the Wilds leads us through the wilds of nature and back to the roots and bones of witchcraft a natural witchcraft that works with the seasons and all the natural items that Mother Nature provides. Drawing on magical folklore, no fancy tools or ceremonial rituals, this is about working with the source. Mother Earth provides us with the changing of the seasons, and within that turning of the year she gives us everything we need to work magic with, from natural energy in the form of storms, rain and sunshine, to tangible items packed full of magical energy such as seeds, leaves and stones. So I'm curious about this one. We will have to see how I feel about it. I'm not sure yet, but I'm going to give it a go. And then lastly, we have By Oak, Ash and Thorn by DJ Conway. Now, this book has been floating around since the 90s. It is all about Celtic shamanism. And that is something that has always really intrigued me. The individuals that have an innate connection to the spiritual plane, to the spiritual world, to the Celtic other world. These are the Celtic shamans that this book is discussing. And so that is something that's always intrigued me and I've never looked further into it. So this one reads as follows. Bring a new balance to your life. 
Many seekers are interested in shamanism because it is a spiritual path that can be followed in conjunction to any religion or other spiritual belief without conflict. Many will associate it with the Native American or African traditions, but these are not the only cultures that traditionally practice shamanism. For centuries, shamanism was practiced by many people, including the Celts. By Oak Ash and Thorn presents a modern system of Celtic shamanism inspired by old writings that suggests that the Druidic order was not the sole system of Celtic religious practice, that other Celts, who were neither Druids nor Bards, possessed and used shamanic powers of healing and prophecy. This is a practical guide which blends the best of Celtic shamanism's old ways and new. It includes healing, astral shape-shifting, Celtic methods of divination such as using stones or oem, and pathworking and the Celtic otherworld. Until now, very little has been written about the more private magical practices of the Celts, this inspiring book ensures that Celtic shamanism will take its rightful place among the spiritual practices to help us lead richer lives. This is one that I'm a little uncertain as to whether I'm going to like or not. There are definitely some mixed responses out there, so I'm going to give it a go. And we'll see. Who knows? It might be amazing, it might be terrible. I'm not sure yet. So those are the books that I got from the speaking tree, but ultimately my favourite shop is Courtyard Books. And while I was in there, I got, I got quite a few, let's put it that way. So these are the books that I got from Courtyard Books. The eagle-eyed among you might have spotted this big green one right here, which is of particular interest to many of you. And I am very, very excited to be able to have it as part of my collection. I didn't think I would ever managed to get it, but I did, and I am incredibly, incredibly grateful that I did. So that I will be talking about last, because I'm annoying like that. The first book that I got is Plants of the Devil by Corrine Boyer. Not sure if I'm saying that name right, I apologise if I'm not. I actually got the first two books in this series from this author last year when I was in Glastonbury, so I figured I had to complete the collection. All of the books are about plant magic and connecting with the energies of different plants and how you can use them, and so I had to add this one to my collection. The blurb reads as follows. Within the shadow-darkened plots of wild nature lies the rough patch known as the Devil's Garden, plants traditionally accorded ill omen, misfortune and malevolence. Dwelling here are poisons such as belladonna, henbane and monkswood, associated with witchcraft and the devil for millennia, and plants that torment and curse, such as blackberry, stinging nettle, briar rose and thistle. In addition to accepted uses, such as healing medicine, history contains a great wealth of folklore, magic and customs associating certain baneful plants with Satan and his minions. Some of these plant powers may be used to call upon the devil's presence, and other herbs possess the power to drive him and his baneful influence away. Each contains a fragment of that diabolical power known as the Wild Adversary, the forces of plant realm which stand opposed to humanity, and which, through greater understanding of their hidden principles, allow a more complete understanding of nature. Now this book has been in my list for a long time, I knew, I just knew that Courtyard Books would have it because they did have the other two, and so I snatched it up because this one? really excites me, probably more than the other two. Last year I actually couldn't get this one, so I didn't manage to get the full set in one go, but I'm so excited about this one in particular because I love working with rose, I love working with nettle and thistle, and a lot of other plants in here that I have never even heard of before seem really intriguing to me with the style of practice that I do undertake, so I had to get it. And actually this one might be one of the first books that I start reading because it looks really good. Next up, we have By Moonlight and Spirit Flight by Michael Howard. Now, this is actually a book that's been in my wish list for a very long time, and I just never ended up getting it. The last time I purchased books, I ended up getting The 13 Keys of Witchcraft and The Witch's Ointment instead of this one. So now I've come back around and I finally got this one. This one is all about astral projection, spirit flight in folklore, and it just looks amazing. It's a really odd size though, I will admit. It's kind of tall and thin, and it's gonna kind of disappear into my bookshelf. That's the only annoying thing that I have about this one, is it's just kind of the wrong size. But it reads as follows. As has been established by historians such as Dr. Carlo Ginsberg and Eva Pox, 
The element of the medieval witch's sabbat contains relics of the ancient spirit cults and localised pagan folk beliefs of Europe. Nocturnal spirit flight, by which the participants of the sabbat travel to their revel, also contained such historical rudiments, notably the night-roving denizens of the Wild Hunt and the shape-shifting Spirit Double. By Moonlight and Spirit Flight, originally published as a monograph in 2013, examines such elements as the ancestral horde, the flight of the furious host, and the entheogenic witch's flying ointment each of which plays a unique role in the flight of the medieval witches. The mythos of the Sabbatic conclave containing infernal and diabolical elements is taken beyond its Christian pathology to connect with the actual practices of folk magic. Now it sounds wordy as hell, but it also sounds really, really interesting. So I did pick this one up to go with the rest of my books on this topic, and I'm gonna see how they all compare to one another. The next book is actually one that I wanted to get last year, but they didn't have a copy of it, and it's basically unavailable everywhere online. And that is Beneficium. This is such a highly praised book that I really wanted to get my hands on it. I actually had to ask the lovely gentleman who worked in the store if he could get this from the front, because all of the copies in the shop itself were hardback and they were just too expensive. So I ended up getting the softback version of it. This one reads as follows. In many Stoic traditions, there exists a colliery between the concepts of poisoner and sorcerer, suggesting a sinistral magical kinship often interchangeable with witchcraft or maledictive magic. Indeed, the use of plant, animal, and mineral toxins is a strand of magic originating in remotest antiquity and reaching to the present day. Beyond its mundane function as an agent of corporeal harm, poison has also served as a gateway of religious ecstasy, occult knowledge, and sensorial aberration as well as the basis of healing cures. Allied with Samael, the serpent of Eden, whose Hebrew name in some translations is Venom of God, this facet of magic went through the rites of ancient summer and Egypt, penetrating European necromancy, alchemy, the arcane, the rites of the witch's Sabbath, and modern day folk magic survivals. This second edition of Beneficium, newly expanded, examines the intersection of magic and poison, collecting the author's early essays on this magical kinship and exploring the toxicological dimensions of occult power. Ooh, it just sounds so freaking good. So I had to get it. I've been after this for years and there's even a section in the middle that is full color. How cool is that? So very excited about this one. I know that it's really hard right now to find this anywhere that will ship to England. I'm not really sure what's going on with it, but I'm so grateful that I managed to get a copy in Courtyard Books. You might notice a theme start to appear in a lot of these books. We have the flames, the candle magic, the cauldrons. We then have the old style magical practice, more historical practice, and then we also have the plants and the beneficium style of practice. That's because this time around, I only got books that I personally was really interested in. So I left behind a lot of the books that maybe seemed interesting for the channel, but I wasn't that interested in it. And I only got the books that I really wanted for my own practice. So this is very much the books that I am reading at this given time and what it is that I personally practice at the moment. So that should give you a better understanding of kind of my magical system at the current time. And the next one also continues along that vein, and that is The 13 Pathways of Occult Herbalism. This is actually by the same author as the last book, so that should really tell you something. This one looks so interesting. I love working with plants, I love old world witchery, so this is a good combination of the two of them. This one reads as follows. The discipline of occult herbalism encompasses the knowledge and use of the magical, spiritual, and folkloric dimensions of plants. This perennial wisdom animates many global spiritual traditions, especially those which have maintained their integrity of transmission, even in the face of industrial development and cultural destruction. Often concealed within the deepest strata of the Western Stoic traditions, the green strand of wisdom, though obscured, is a potential legacy of all magic, sorcery, and occult science. In addition to the hard sciences of botany, ethnology, agriculture, and ethnopharmacology, a number of pathways can assist the magical herbalist in furthering the depth of understanding and integrity of personal approach. 13 Pathways of Occult Herbalism circumscribes the meta-paradigm of herbal magical practice, providing useful examples of its manifestation, as well as demonstrating its time-honoured roots of antiquity. This one also seems really wordy, but this seems really interesting, and I figured if I was gonna get Beneficium, I should probably get this one as well. So I did. 
I then got a really tiny book. This is Witchcraft in Cornwall by Kelvin I. Jones. And this is another one of those books that I get to boost up my collection. I love collecting really unusual witchcraft pieces and witchcraft books. And this is one of them. It's really, really tiny. It's tiddly tiddly, but it looks really interesting. It says on the back, this is the first serious attempt to chart the history of witchcraft in the county of Cornwall. More than any other county, Cornwall has retained many of the traditions of the old religion, despite the onslaught of Christianity. This volume charts the history of the witchcraft persecutions, looks at the folklore surrounding the practitioners of the craft, and links the customs of witchcraft to the sacred sites of Cornwall. Witchcraft in Cornwall also contains a transcript of the only fully documented case of hysterical possession to take place in the county. Originally, this was two pounds when it was published. It is a little bit damaged and it is quite old, very tiny writing, tiny, tiny. And this is another one that's gonna end up in my delicate drawer. That makes it sound like underwear. I meant like delicate books. <laughs> Don't get your head in the gutter. But I have a few that are quite old, quite damaged from the 50s or 60s. This one was published in the 90s, but it's obviously been kept in pretty bad areas. So I tend to keep these nice and flat in a cool, dry, completely dark space so that they don't get damaged. So this is one of them. Don't think you'll be able to find this one anywhere. If you do, it will probably not be in good condition anyway. But just thought I'd throw that one in there for curiosity's sake. The next book is one that I'm actually not sure if I already have. I'm pretty certain that I haven't. I think I put it in my basket on the Witchcraft Museum website, but I never actually purchased it. This is from Troy Books, and many of you will know my love for Troy Books. This is From Granite to Sea, The Folklore of Bodmin Moor and East Cornwall by Alex Langstone. Now, I love combining folklore, history, and magical practice. That's why I love practicing folk magic, traditional witchcraft, and the like. And so this is one that really intrigued me. I do also have a lot of the Troy books, and I find that all of them are really interesting. Even if it's not a specific topic that you've really thought of before, it could be worth checking out because they are really well done. This one reads as follows. Cornwall is an ancient land steeped in legend and mystery. From Granite to Sea explores the folklore of the often overlooked eastern reaches of the rugged Cornwall Peninsula, at the heart of which lies the mysterious upland of Bodmin Moor. This beautiful and remote land of granite which forms the Cornish Highlands inhabits 80 square miles across the central spine of eastern Cornwall, a wild and mysterious landscape where folklore permeates every hill, rock and river, inhabited by piskies, giants and conjurers, who in turn control the old trackways, hilltops and weather. It is a land haunted by the wild hunt of the devil's dandy dogs and the demonic spectre of the Trig Eagle. I've probably said that really wrong, I apologise. From Granite to Sea is the first ever comprehensive focus on the folklore of Eastern Cornwall. Alex Langstone's groundbreaking study will guide the reader through the myriad of old tales of witches, conjurers and charmers, supernatural encounters, amazing folk traditions and curious customs from the high moors and rugged cliff tops of eastern Cornwall. Now, I've always been fascinated by Bodmin Moor my entire life. I've heard stories about it, so I just had to get this one and see if I could read something that I maybe had never heard before. The last of the more commonly found books is a big one. This is Sigils, Ciphers and Scripts by M. B. Jackson. Now, I originally saw this book back in 2016 and I've seen it every year since and I've never purchased it until now. For whatever reason, I just really wanted to get this book, so I did. Inside looks really interesting. It has information in it that I have been after for a long time on lots of different signs and symbols, including things that I've never even heard of before, like astrograms. Never heard of an astrogram before, but I'm going to be excited to check this out and see what it all says about it. It isn't a very big book. It is pretty small, if you can see that way, but obviously it's quite big size-wise. So I don't think it's going to take me that long to get through, but it does look really interesting. The back goes as follows. The occult art of magical writing begins in prehistory with the creation of the two element signs called the dot or egg and the line serpent or sperm. 
These two lines are the mother and father of all other signs, symbols, and letters that have come into being. The meaning and form of these signs has been symbolically refined over the millennia by magicians. In the form of magic letters, they are signatures, literal and abstract, of the universal focus of creation from whence all knowledge originates. Concisely written and richly illustrated, this is the most accessible and informative book on the occult history and graphic origins of the signs, symbols, scripts, and ciphers of Western occultism. So, I'm gonna give it a go. I don't think it's gonna take me that long to read, so I'll be interested to see if it's any good. The last two books are probably the most special books in my collection now. I am shocked that I was able to get them and very grateful to the people who gave them to me as gifts or gave me the money to be able to get them because I probably wouldn't have got these otherwise. They are both from Black Letter Press and some of you will likely recognize that name as they create some of the most beautiful and sought after witchcraft and occult books that you can get. They are absolutely gorgeous and they're often rebindings and reprints of really old pieces of occult literature. The first one is the Red Dragon. This one was recommended to me by the gentleman in the shop in Courtyard Books. If you ever have the chance to go in and talk to Steve, he is an absolute amazing person. He is so knowledgeable on so many of the books in there. So he recommended me this book having read it himself and I just had to get it. It is absolutely beautiful. I'm shocked by just how gorgeous this is with the printed spine. It is just unbelievably beautiful. The first page gives you an indication of what this book is all about. It says, The Red Dragon, the grand grimoire of magic, the art of commanding spirits, celestial and infernal alike, with many other secrets of the magical art. This book is so beautiful. It is unbelievably beautiful. And it is also incredibly interesting. I will read you a small section of the introduction just to give you an idea. This is actually what the gentleman in the shop read to me that sold me on the book, so maybe it might do the same for you. This is a work of wickedness by wicked people for other wicked people. Reputedly, just possessing a copy made you a wicked person. You didn't have to actually read the thing. Just opening was enough to mark you as an enemy of God and reason in a France where both mattered a great deal. With me so far, congratulations, you are now wicked too. And I just, I had to get this book, I had to get it. I, it just, it just looks amazing. So I am gonna give this one a really good read. It is one of my most prized books in my collection now. I am so grateful to my friend who essentially paid for this book for me uh, because otherwise I probably wouldn't have got it. So this is very exciting for me. And then the other one is probably the most exciting thing I've maybe ever purchased, ever. Um, some of you will likely have seen this book on Instagram or floating around the interweb and may have thought to yourself, wow, that looks amazing and I am with you. It did look absolutely amazing and I was of the opinion that I would never, ever possess a copy myself in my entire life. And yet my parents very graciously offered to buy it for me for my birthday. So thank you very much uh, to my loving parents who support me even through all the weird shenanigans that I do, and got me natural magic, which is honestly probably one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen. Sadly, the wall kind of makes it disappear. This is the book in question. It is absolutely beautiful. I honestly cannot get over how stunning this is. It is just unbelievably beautiful. It is also by Black Letter Press and it is honestly just, <sighs> I can't even describe how beautiful it is. I'll be honest, I've struggled to summarize this book for approximately 20 minutes in this video. It's very difficult for me to reduce the entire contents of this book, its history, many different translations and everything else that goes along with it into a simple paragraph. So instead, I will do my best to read a small section of the preface that will hopefully give you a better understanding of what this book is and where it came from. 
Ultimately though, this is a reprint. This is obviously an English translation of much, much older works that have been translated dozens of times in the past. They've altered it in such a way to make it readable for the modern viewer because the original text was basically unreadable and then published in this stunning book by Black Letter Press. The small section of the preface goes as follows, but please don't shoot me down for my probably questionable pronunciation. Some of these words, and some of these names my brain cannot comprehend, so apologies in advance. Gian Battista della Porta got in trouble with the Inquisition for not taking witchcraft seriously enough. That's the author of the book for reference, the original author of the book. Admittedly, in Italy, witchcraft accusations seldom came to court because they failed to meet the standards the canon courts demanded, so to earn the kind of censure in a region noted for viewing accusations of magical criminality with scepticism is an achievement. Guillaume Basta was a wide-ranging gentleman scientist, the scope of whose work is difficult to encapsulate. Pretty much everything is not far off the mark. He published on alchemy, the virtues of the natural world, and plants in particular, and optics. Indeed, his works in magnification led him to dispute the position of foremost Italian pioneer of the scientific use of the telescope with Galileo. Natural Magic, which he published in four books in 1558, and expanded to 20 books in 1589, ranges across his areas of expertise and interest always emphasising the hands-on experimental experience of himself and his wide circle of friends. So that is about as brief a description as I can give for that book because, oh my goodness, it is dense, but it's fascinating and I'm so excited to give it a read. So those are all of the things that I got in Glastonbury over my birthday trip. It's a lot, I know it's a lot, and it is extreme, you do not have to be that extreme. No one needs as many things as I have here. But because of my job, because of the education I do on YouTube, I do get a lot more stuff than you would probably need. I will leave all of the names and links to everything in the description if you would like to check it out for yourself. If you do wanna see where I got all of these things from, I will leave the video link to the vlog in the description box. And yeah, I know it's a lot, and I apologize for the exceptionally long video, but maybe this might have inspired some of you to expand your reading lists, or maybe you might have found a few more small businesses or brick and mortar stores that you might want to support for yourself. Have you read any of these books? Do you own any of them? Have you shopped at any of the stores before? I would absolutely love to know. Please let me know down in the comment section. If you did enjoy this video, feel free to give it a like. It really means so much to me. If you do have any questions, comments, concerns, video ideas, or just want to chit chat with the community, feel free to post a comment down in the comment section. And if you do enjoy the magical content on this channel or in this video, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. So with that being said, I hope you have a marvellous magical day and I will see you in the next video. Bye. It's okay. Okay. It's okay. Thank goodness. I forgot once I put this lipstick on, I had this dawning realization of hang on the last time I wore this, it smeared into like a smile line. So I looked a little bit like the Joker, which although is a look, it's not exactly the look I'm going for. I really hope the lighting is all right. I broke my filming light. More accurately, I blew my filming light. To be fair, it has been with me for eight years, 10 years, eight years, which is honestly pretty impressive for a cheap filming light. So I got a new one and it destroyed my hand. You can't actually really see it, but I've cut my hand up trying to fix it. It's so difficult to put up, but it actually looks really nice. Like it's more diffused. So I'm hoping that the lighting in this video is good. Fingers crossed. This book is actually one that I have been after for a long, long time. This is Beneficium by Daniel A. Skulky? Shulky. Skulky? I'm so sorry, I can't pronounce names. Oh, that's where my sunglasses are. I lost these. Okay. Found them. Mm -hmm.